Um, so kia ora te whanau, uh, ko Siope te Maunga, uh, ko Moana Nui Akiwa te Moana, uh, ko Hamoa, Nui o ko Whenua, uh, ke o Tahuhu toko Kainga, a nai nei, uh, ko uh, Sunny toko Papa, ko Vitoi toko Mama, ko Dallin toko Tane, uh, ko Joshua toko Ingoa, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, Talo for lava, um, fakalo for lahiatu. Um, happy sign language week, um, and happy mental health awareness week as well. Uh, my name is Joshua Yosefo, and it is such uh, an honor uh, to be able to share with you uh, all for creative uh, mornings today. Um, I want to thank uh, Sophie uh, for inviting me for this talk this morning. Thank you, Soph. Um, and, and also extend my thanks to the team uh, behind this organization as well as this cause. Um, so just a little bit about me before we jump into uh, my talk this morning. I am Samon Yuweyan, uh, born and raised in South Auckland. Very proud of that. Uh, my grandparents first migrated here in 1959, uh, where they lived in Taihepe, out of all places. Uh, so our family's claim to fame is that my grandma gave birth to the first ever Samoan baby in Taihepe, and we yeah, that's, you were very proud of that as a family. Um, my father is a policeman, and my mother is an academic and a teacher. Uh, my parents actually both met in a club, uh, proving that you can find love in a club. However, I don't know if you can find contraception because thus I am here. Um, I have one younger sibling uh, who has never cut his hair uh, since the day he was born. Uh, we are actually 16 years apart and unlike me, he loves maths. Me and maths, we don't quite get along. Um, I am engaged to the love of my life and like every millennial, we met online um, and eventually met in person in Hawaii, out of all places, come through romance. Um, he used to work as a hula dancer and now he is dancing his way to become a social worker here in Aotearoa. Um, I have a cat named Jackson who I dearly love. And so I do see there is a dog here. So I'm here for pet loving, animal loving people. You are my people. Um, Jackson has been in my life for five years now. Oh my gosh, making it sound like, you know, <laughs> he's been in my life for five years now. Um, and he probably doesn't know how much he means to me. Um, I have him tattooed on my leg. Um, <laughs> um, and I also have created his own Instagram account. Um, so Samurai Jackson, that's his tag. So if you feel like, um, you know, following an amazing, gorgeous cat, then you can follow Jackson. Um, yeah, Jackson has no idea he has an Instagram page, but anyway. Um, my hobbies <laughs> include uh, watching anime, playing video games, hanging out with friends, listening to K-pop, but not quite nailing the dance moves, um, as well as like, you know, the feeling of after doing a workout, but sometimes not the workout itself, but the feeling afterwards, I enjoy that moment. That moment, yes, we're here for that. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> um, now in terms of my creativity and how that has really manifested in my life is it really started with writing. Uh, my love for writing started when I was about 10 to 11 years old because I just love to read. Um, and it's kind of just manifested over the years and developed. So um, I enjoy writing uh, poetry, enjoy writing for film, um, as well as theater. And that kind of has um, expanded into directing theater and film as well. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, now, I just do want to preface before I go into my talk that I am going to be vulnerable this morning. So I'm going to be following the steps of Brene Brown, and I'm going to be seeing vulnerability as a way of courage. So I'm going to be flexing my courage this morning um, and saying that uh, the talk this morning, uh, so it will be mentioning sensitive topics uh, such as suicide, mental health, and molestation. So if you're not positioned to hear about these things this morning, please do whatever you may need to do to feel safe, such as muting or leaving the call altogether, totally no stress at all. I will have a little note on one slide where I do kind of talk about these things to alert uh, those who may want to mute. So you'll see it on the slide, you can totally mute, no feelings, all good in, in the hood, totally fine. Um, now, if you do want to ask personal questions following this talk, I am contactable via Facebook and I'm happy to point you to helpful professional services if need be. All right, so let's kind of get into this talk, Spectrum, right? So when I kind of uh, came across, well, I didn't come across this thing, when I was given this theme, I was, I was really kind of stumped in, and Laura kind of uh, touched on it. Like this, this, this theme is amazing, it's so vast. And so to kind of help understand um, 
a way that I could really elaborate on what spectrum means to me. I looked on the website um, for uh, Creative Mornings, and this is how they describe spectrum. They said that spectrum is a band of colors, expanding definitions, a broad array of identities. We all live within multiple spectrums, colliding and intersecting with one another. And so from this, what really stood out to me is a band of colors, um, like a, a collective of colors. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about uh, two main things. The first thing is the spectrum of self. Um, what is the, interse the intersectionality of, of self? So for example, uh, with me, I am Samoan, I'm from South Auckland, I'm third generation born, I am queer, I'm a Japanese speaking, like all of these things that make up who I am. Um, and, and, and this morning, we're going to be diving deeper into actually the intersectionality of experiences as well. Um, so life events, things that happen to you. The second thing we're going to be talking about is the spectrum of, of self in relation to others. So um, looking at the intersectionality of self and then how do those intersections relate to other people and their own identities and their context and their lives. Cool. Oh my gosh, let me just get my notes. See? So the title of my talk this morning is Spectrum, Building a Creative Community I Can't Do Bad All By Myself. In order to build a community, you need to be able to connect with other creative people, other people in general. And so to kind of uh, talk about uh, the spectrum of self, I will be sharing about my story. Now, I, I, I will be talking about the intersections of experiences that I've experienced in my life. And to kind of portray this, I'm gonna be sharing my story in two ways. And the first way is the romantic story. So I'm going to be giving you the networking story, the, the professional story, the story of all my accolades, the story that's on my CV, the story that I would like everyone to know. And this is the story here. I was born into a loving family in South Auckland. I was ducks of my primary school. I excelled in high school and had private tutors. I finished high school with three scholarships and was already a published writer. I didn't sit my exams because I had already passed. I couldn't qualify for student allowance because my parents earned too much. I worked three jobs while studying full time as a way to further my working portfolio. I was awarded graduate of the year at university and was also named valedictorian. That is the romantic story. That is the, the networking story or the professional story. And now we're going to pivot now to the actual story. What is the actual story? Uh, let's address the intersections um, of my life um, and the experiences that I've had. So this is the actual story. And please feel free to mute this part um, of my talk. Totally fine. And you can just unmute it once we move on to the next slide. So this is the actual story. I was born into a poor, loving family in South Auckland. During primary school, I was seen a child therapist as I was a victim of molestation. The tutors were my auntie and another girl from church. They were both free. In my last year of high school, I came out to my family and got kicked out of home. Virtually homeless and penniless, I didn't sit my exams because I couldn't afford to catch the bus. I couldn't qualify for student allowance because I had no relationship with my parents and studying link didn't believe in my case. So instead I had to ask a predator for money so that I could afford to pay the building levy at university. I worked three jobs while studying full time in order to survive. I worked six months straight at a, at a time with no days off and was stuck in a toxic relationship. During my university studies, I suffered greatly from depression and anxiety, often self-harming and attempted to take my own life twice. Now, this is not the actual story, and these things may be quite heavy to hear, uh, but it is important because these experiences, these intersections, actually are important threads that make up the fabric of who I am. The romantic story is true, and the actual story is true. Both stories speak to the spectrum of experiences that make up a small aspect of who I am as a person. To ignore the vast human experience is to ignore the victory when overcoming adversity. So if we were to code my story 
if we were to kind of look at my story as a form of research and code all of the experiences that I've been through, these are the, are the key words. These are, these are the subjects that really encapsulate my story. These are the key words. We have family, queer, basfika, mental health, and suicide prevention. Now, these are these are the key words of my of my of my story. And now, let's now pivot now to the shared story. So, this is what I've experienced. These are the intersections that I have I have gone through. Now, let's kind of pull back a bit and let's look at the context of my community and where I'm from and where I live. And this is the shared story. So here we go. This is the shared story. Cases of family harm are reported every four minutes. That means that every four minutes in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there is a case of family harm happening. That means that within the time that I've spoken to you so far, there have been two cases um, committed already or reported. In 2016, 553 people died from suicide. For every female suicide, there are 2.9 male suicides. This is just in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Rainbow identifying people are 75% more likely to be socially excluded. That means that rainbow identifying people are 75% more likely to feel lonely um, and to feel isolated. Uh, rainbow identifying people are also 56% more likely to experience mental illness and distress compared to 30% of non-rainbow identifying people. And only 25% of Pacific people will access mental health care compared to 58% of New Zealanders overall, that is almost half half the amount. So our Pacific people are not accessing mental health care. These statistics are not stacked up against me, but they are stacked up beside me and with me. One of the things that I really struggled to do with in the past was to call out these statistics, call out the data. And I personally didn't agree with, with the deficit thinking and, and instead would retreat in my own little bubble, bubble. However, to ignore the data of the marginalized is to reject empathy. And one of, the, one of the traps that I actually fell into was in my, with, within my own creative journey is this illusion of isolation. I was so enveloped in my own self-expression that I really struggled to see the bigger picture. But what I learned over my time is that there is no point in being creative if you are the only one who benefits. There is no point in being creative if you're the only one who benefits. And I struggle to see the beauty of creating with and alongside others. So this is what I have. I have my uh, the intersections of self, of me, who I am, my experiences. I understand my experiences in, in my own context, in reference to Aotearoa, in reference to being Pacific, to being queer, to addressing mental health, to addressing suicide prevention. So what should we do? What do I do? And so this is what we did. In March last year, our creative collective Odd Family, made up of 52 members, put on our debut work Odd Daphne in the heart of South Auckland at Mangere Art Centre. This autobiographical play based on my actual story is about a Pasifika family navigating their way around mental health and suicide prevention. It addresses the attention and support needed for Pacifica families, highlighting the dire need for queer Pacifica people to receive mental health support and support from their families. It features openly queer characters, and I've been told that it is, it is the first time a same-sex kiss has ever been shared on stage in Mangare Art Centre. A little bit about the play. So in our first season, despite being actually nobodies in the theater or wellbeing community, we were an unknown name. We were a Trojan horse. We defied the odds and performed in front of a sold out season. That's 1,150 people who ended up seeing our show. We also had students from Mount Roscoe Grammar School watch our show and use our story for their health, drama, and English assessments. We also gave audience members the opportunity to sign up for mental health first aid training. And we had over 50 families sign up and complete the training after watching our first season. 
from the first season and from the positive outcomes and energy created from the first season, it was clear that our community still needed the story. And so we came back this year with a second season, which also sold out, but this time we included a matinee and a school show. We had Mangere Arts, uh, Mangere College, Tangano College, including their parenting unit, Eden Campus, Mount, Ros Mount Roscoe Grammar School, and Aurete College come through and write about the show for their assessments. Uh, many of the schools, Bar Eden Campus and Mount Roscoe Grammar School, are directly in the communities which we wanted to serve, being in South Auckland, with predominantly um, Pacific and Maori students uh, facing a lot of the statistics that I did mention earlier. We had workshops um, at their schools unpacking the show. And from our second season, we had over 1,380 people attend. We also had mindfulness coloring in books, which people could purchase by one of our artists um, who was part of our collective. One of the most surprising things from Odd Daphne and from this experience of creating Odd Family was that we were named as one of the finalists for the New Zealand Playwright Script Writing Competition and also won the Hackman's Cup for Most Original Production in the Auckland Theatre Awards. And so from this, we see that my pain, that the pain of the intersections of my life was given purpose and my story became a catalyst for a community changing play. Now let's just rewind a little bit. So we've mentioned all of the good that we've done, but how did we get here? And this is the process of how it all started. So how did we get here, everyone? It started with the call out. This is a screenshot of literally the first page of the script and the message that I put on Facebook. I literally just put up a message on Facebook. I read a script. Does anyone want to hop on board? Now, the bittersweet thing about me that I have learned to change, but the bittersweet thing about me in my early 20s was that one of the things that I used to do super cringe is I didn't just wear my heart on my sleeve, I wore my heart on my social media sleeve, right? So that meant <laughs> that everybody knew my business. If I was sad, everyone knew about it. If I was happy, everybody knew about it. And so People kind of knew all of the ups and downs I was going through via social media, the good, the bad, most definitely the ugly. So when I did put up this call out, I think people were like, oh, wow, okay, yep, yeah, he's ready to kind of do something about all the stuff he's gone through. And that's kind of what this call out was. Um, and so a bit of sweet regrets, but also um, people responded to the call. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and one of the key things I learned from this experience is that creativity should also spark connection. So after we did the call out, we actually did the script reading. This is the first, this is the first script reading that we ever had. This is in May of 2018, May of 2018. And these are all the people who came to the first script reading. So once a call out was made, people moved, people came, they wanted to be a part of this movement, they had no idea what it was about, they literally just saw a name on Daphne, it was a script, and they attended, they came, because creativity sparks connection. One of the things that I knew with myself, in terms of telling uh, such a vulnerable story, and a story of strength and of hope, is that I also needed to, to have my own support systems in place. And so I had a beautiful leadership team, uh, started off with just Emma and Haley, uh, which, but now has expanded to six uh, people. We have Sarah, and we have Kamal, we have Samuel, um, and we also have Yusuf. And this is the leadership team that is kind of behind um, all that we do. Um, and with this leadership team, what we did is, because the original uh, script for Our Daphne was pitched as a film, but what we realized is that to make a film, it's, 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 it's so much, so much effort, so much money that we do not have and so we decided look our communities need this show this cause really um is really before the work and so we decided to um make it and uh, adapt it to a theater production uh which thus uh gave birth to our oh, daphne the theater uh show and and one of the things i learned is uh in terms of creating it a big uh, starting a creative community is literally, you can't do battle by yourself. You need people uh, to keep you accountable. You need people to ask you the hard questions. You need people who will stand by you and with you. And this, these are who these people are for me. 
Um, uh, together, we also um, managed to receive funding. So these are all of the amazing funders uh, and supporters that we had that really backed our cause, which has been really beautiful to have. Um, and I remember the first time when we received our first lot of funding, I honestly didn't believe it. I didn't believe it at all. I called my parents. I was like, oh my gosh, we got funding. What the hell? Like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like, we're going to do this. And it was such an amazing feeling. And yeah, and we have been so lucky uh, to really have support from other communities. And one thing that I did learn is creativity sparks connection, uh, but also what it can also spark um, is collaboration with other like-minded organizations and people who are about the same cause. Um, following, we actually had an audition, which was really cool. Um, so we did the audition thing, um, but something didn't feel right with me. Something didn't sit right with the co-papa of this work. And so after the audition, what ended up happening was I kind of went back to what I, what I really value as a director and as a creative and what we value as a team. And what we value is purposeful connections. And that meant that the method of how we casted needed to change because we wanted, there is an importance of connection um, and but because we really value the importance of connection. Um, have you ever been to those networking events? I've been to I've been to quite a lot. And you know, it's almost like you've got this radar and, and when people talk to you, they're literally categorizing you when they see you, right? What they're asking is when they ask you, oh, hi, my name's Joshua, what do you do? What they're saying is, hi, my name's Joshua, are you worthy enough of my time? You know what I mean? And that's 100% the way that I feel when I go to a lot of these networking events. It's like, display your worthiness and let's see if we can connect and maybe we can climb together. You know, like that's kind of the vibe. And with the auditions, that, that's definitely not what I wanted to happen. That is not what, what the co-papa of our family was about. So I kind of went back and, and what I realized is that caring enables connection, whereas networking enables niceties. And we didn't want networking. We wanted a pure, genuine connection. And so what that meant is that the final casting looked very different to what I first thought it would be, because I chose the final cast based on three things. Number one was the connection to me as a person. Um, that number two was the connection to the story and how they're related to the story. And uh, that was number two. And number three is their connection to others. How can this space, this collective of creatives help them as a person? And so what ended up happening is our final cast ended up becoming, so this is, yeah, this is our first, um, the first, the, the final cast of our first season, Missing Emma as well as Sam, who played um, other characters. But this became the final cast. Like, I just want to mention, if we kind of think back to my story where I shared about um, the conflict of relationship between me and my parents, this was a beautiful moment. My parents were casted as the parents in the play. So my mom played my mom. That is my mom. And the orange, hold, she's in the orange uh uh, she is holding the cake. That is my mom, my biological mother. That is her. And then there is my father who was wearing the blue shirt and um, the fedora. And that is my actual dad. Um, and now if we also uh, go um, to Emily, who is uh, the woman wearing uh, the overall, she is actually one of my bestest friends and really and helped me with, within my uh, own mental health journey. We've also got uh, different friends there. We've got Ola, who is also online. Me and him played netball together, um, you know? And so all of these um, connections, if, if, you, if, if we had like a theater, um, uh, like a like a dramaturg to come in and look at our casting, they'll literally be like, you have people with zero experience carrying the show. And I was like, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> um, and, and that's exactly what we were about. We were all about connections. How, because I honestly believe that connections are going to carry this work. And so this is actually the context of how everyone joined. We've got Haley, um, who was just in the black and white picture there. We graduated together. Uh, we, we studied together. And then we've got my parents and my younger brother. Um, if you look at the zombie picture with me and two friends, one of the zombies, his name's Martin, and he actually came on board as an engineer. Uh, he, he's an engineer and also as well as a builder. And he came and he built the set um, alongside one of my other friends, Athena. We've got... Um, in the middle there, the picture of all of us doing our little, you know, 
little sign um, that the, the woman in the middle who has really held it down for our Daphne as a co-director, her name is Emma Gillies. She was my drama teacher. Um, and she has carried me through when I first came out to my family. She was the one who offered me support. Um, we've got my partner there. Um, that's both of us at our first Pride in Hawaii. Um, and he actually came and worked backstage um, in, in the season two. We've got my um, family from the Oceania Leadership Network at AUT. And we've also got Moss, which is a dance collective that I dance with. And they all came on board um, to, to really uh, make this work happen. And so once we had everyone through, we went into the rehearsal process, which one again, which, which once again kind of went against what all of the drama books tell us. Instead of having a two month or one month lead up before the first show, we had a six month lead up. Um, half a year, we literally spent half a year um, preparing for the show. And this included everyone going through mental health first aid training together. That was really important for me and for us to do as a collective. The second thing we did is um, I invited people over for dinner at my house. I just cooked them dinner. They came over. We talked. We ate. We laughed. We danced. We just it, we just got to know each other and we got to connect. Uh, we did a lot of team building. Um, we even spent um, New Year's Eve building the set. We, we would go swimming together. The whole uh, co-papa of this work was actually about creating meaningful connections. And that in the end is, is really the reason, uh, the, the answer for our success um, over the two seasons. It was only because we cared that we were able to carry our Daphne. So um, where are we now? So this is what continued relationships um, look like. So because we had, uh, because we were really invested in our relationships, we realized that relationships don't stop once the project ends. They continue growing and going. So here we've got, we've got pictures here. We've got us, uh, we camped together. That was us at camp last year. Such a good time. Um, the picture on the top left-hand corner, that's us on the second season. On the bottom left-hand corner, one of our girls, beautiful, beautiful Day Day, um, who played in Odd Daphne as one of our aunties. Um, she graduated from university and we all went to a graduation together. Um, you know, we're all in support of each other. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, that is me uh, proposing to my fiance and my entire, all of the Odd Family cast were all there and they were all there to witness the moment and I wouldn't have it any other way. So we, and so right now we have a few projects up our sleeves um, we're, that we are working on behind the scenes, which includes, um, want, we want to make our Daphne into a film. We want to make it accessible for more people so that more people can hear this message. Um, and so, yes, we are wanting to make it into a feature film. So yes, if you are, if you want to help us, feel free to connect, you know, it, it, it is a big, a big task, a big job. Um, and, and what I do want to do, uh, close with is this, is just these final words, is that if you create a space where everyone feels safe, supported and loved, you will always, always have a thriving creative community. Um, and I hope that that is a final message you're able to take away from this talk. Uh, kia ora and thank you, thank you so, so much for having me this morning. Um, that's enough of me talking for now. Um, and yes, thank you all. Hey Josh, um, I think that everyone will probably agree with me when I say I don't think there's ever going to be enough of you talking. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, we have a bit of time for questions. If any of you do need to go to work, um, please feel free, but we do have some questions and please drop them into the chat for Josh. Um, and also Josh just uh, in the chat, there's some really lovely messages coming through as well as one from a completely random audience member saying that your mum's really hot. She, <laughs> she did. She... Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I could have been your mom, I don't know. <laughs> um, cool, so we'll jump into the questions and yeah, please feel free, everyone, if you have another question for Josh to chuck it into the chat. Um, if you do need to head off, we've keep, we'll keep recording the questions so that you can check back in on them later. Um, so the first one I've got is from Leilani 
and she is someone who works in schools across Aotearoa and has strong ties to Pacifica youth. She wants to know how can educators and the education system in general better equip our Pacifica queer youth who are trying to understand and accept their fabric? It's a big, big question. Yeah, big question and an amazing question. Um, I, I through through my work with schools that I've done, um, and also working uh, with Akumata to who teach first NZ, um, I have really been able to kind of test the temperature of where the education the education system is at. We kind of just look at the resources that are available for queer Pacifica young people, there are next to none, unfortunately. We have the Village Collective, um, who do have some resources, but even them themselves um, are lacking um, mobilization in terms of uh, an, on a national scale. So I do think that actually there, that, that is a, an area that I personally really want to help um, create some sort of uh, 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 some greater support in but honestly that is that is an area that is lacking in our education system and we really need to do something about it um, because yeah our queer bus speaker people are a priority um, but in terms of as a teacher what you can do um, I have had teachers in the past email me and ask uh, me uh, what they can do for their queer bus speaker students I'm more than happy uh, to directly uh, link you to the village collective they actually teach um, teachers as well as parents and um, and social workers about how on how to create safe spaces for queer Pacifica young people. They have like modules, they have um, resources available and really practical ways as well, which you can do that. So um, I'm more than happy to link you to the Village Collective. Um, yeah, they, they are a charity organization who, who are really about that co-papa. Um, but yeah, they, they, at this point, they are the only organization that does that uh, to my knowledge, but that is definitely something that we really need to strengthen here. Um, and our education system for sure. Um, thanks Josh and so Leilani and anyone else on the call um, that's a really generous offer from Josh so please reach out to him if you want to be connected up with the Village Collective. Yes please. We've got one from Heather who has said thanks for the, your insights. Um, do you have any advice for young Pacifica creatives who might have a challenging time pursuing their creative passion because they're not getting family support? Oh yeah oh my gosh. That is such a big one. That is such a such a big one, um, and because 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 if we look at the context of our Pacifica people, so 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 here's here's something in my research that I really found uh, very alarming. Right, is that the is that a Pacifica people earn the average earnings of a Pacifica person is twenty three thousand six hundred and eighty six dollars a year. That is less than half of the median, in, the median income of the average New Zealander. So our Pacifica people are um, struggling already as it is to make ends meet. Now, if you match that with a creative pathway or a creative career, as we all know, to be a full-time creative, it, it's not a very lucrative job. It's, it's either, you know, it's, it's either warm, it's either hot or cold. And so and so from, a, from, from our Pacific context, there is so much intersectionality that we need to address. Um, and so I can really empathize with, say, for example, families or parents who may feel that financial struggle when their child is saying, I want to pursue a creative career um, because of the financial situation that us as a people are in. However, um, I have had experience where, where, where students or young people have come up to me and they're just like, you know, they want to pursue this. Um, I, I honestly think it really does come back uh, to um, flexing that courage, um, being vulnerable and having really honest talanoa, honest conversations with parents and sometimes having a mediator to really explain, um, explain and to really hold space is really helpful when having those important conversations um, with our families. Um, and so, yeah, I, that, that's something I'd, I would encourage. Um, but I think it is also really important um, to really understand what is actually um, the context that is surrounding our Pacific creatives um, and just how, you know, they've really got to, they've really got to work so hard um, and really got to fight through um, to really kind of get these opportunities. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice to, yeah, kind of 
have have a, a mediated or, or just a very honest and vulnerable conversation so that um yeah the parents are able to listen to what their child really wants in life thanks josh um, the next question that we've got is uh one about you personally as from boba so as an artist and kind of communications um, person, how did you adjust your personal and professional life um, in the crazy year of 2020 and COVID-19 times? Um, how have your, how's your work and the odd family um, been affected during lockdown? Amazing. Yeah, such a good question. Um, one of the things, I guess, uh, not so much gambles, but one of the, um, the kind of new, a new mantra that I really wanted to, um, kind of uh, adopt with Odd Family and, and with our work and, and our collective was that we all mutually agreed that um, if, we, if, we, if we need a rest, we will rest. And if we need a work, we will work. And so what we really saw COVID as being is actually a time for all of us uh, to really honor the time with our families, to really honor um, a lot of the, uh, to actually address some of the financial situations that were happening in our families. Um, and so we saw that as a time for us as our family to pause, to allow um, our members uh, to really, uh, to rest, to recuperate, to replenish, and to also, um, do what they needed to do to kind of get through COVID times. Um, so yeah, I, I did see that as, as a way of, of um, I did see COVID as like a, okay, time to pause. Um, and actually it, it hit uh, just a few weeks after we finished season two. And so in terms of our energy levels, um, it kind of went with where we were at as a team as well. Thank you. Um, cool, I think we've just got, um, a couple of last questions. Um, this one's almost a bit of a recommendation from Boba, I think. So, um, you said, do you have time to attend high schools, or, or you're already doing this, attending high schools, talking workshops um, to tackle the issues that you're talking about? Is that something you're doing? She said that um, she feels the youngsters definitely need a role model like you. Yeah, oh, awesome. Yes, uh, so I uh, definitely... Um, as a script is being used as a learning resource for high schools. So if you would like your students to study our Daphne, um, we've had um, teachers who teach uh, drama as well as English and health approach us. So if you would like to teach that, um, we do have workshops also available that we can run to unpack the story. Uh, what we find is sometimes when you are trying to unpack subjects and topics such as mental health and, and wellbeing, um, suicide prevention, um, et cetera, it's really nice to have a text uh, to work from as a resource for students to really kind of comprehend and relate to. Um, so yeah, if you are keen to teach our Daphne, um, then yeah, definitely be in contact and our team will be able to help you and also hold workshops at your school. Thank you. Um, and I thought we were done, but there's actually been an amazing question just come through from Jess. So I'm gonna ask it, hopefully you've got time. Yeah. Uh, in presenting your story and the story of um, inequalities that you've faced, how do you navigate around negative stereotyping? Yeah, yeah, such a, how do I nav navigate around negative stereotyping? I have done this since the day I came out of the womb. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like, and anyone who has had those stereotypes, you know, just kind of haunting it, it's almost like this thing that unfortunately is all is there, is always there, and is just something that, if anything, has kind of um, really I've kind of seen it as a as a launching pad um, to really uh, almost yeah as a launching pad to continue the work that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I, I do feel that the temperature of where um, Aotearoa is at the moment, as we are, yeah, we, I, I think we are getting. Uh, slowly but surely we are getting better at all of those things um but i think uh such an a practical tool for people to know is just pronouncing pronouncing people's names is such a beautiful way to affirm them and a beautiful way to say i see you and you as a person and your context and i think that in itself is such a great a, a great thing just pronounce people's uh names properly um but yeah that's such a big question but honestly yeah since the day I came out of the womb, I've been fighting my whole life. 